good morning everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, today we have three separate talks uh, delivered by our chief residents and our cornea fellow. Um, we're going to start with uh, Dr. Chris Conradi. He's our chief resident, as you know, and uh, we're really proud of him. He's uh, matched into the Uveitis Fellowship right here at the Moran, so he'll be staying with us next year. Um, today he's going to present on uh, retinitis and the immunocompromised. Anyone's guess? Sounds interesting. Okay, so I promise this will be a fairly um, short talk. Okay, so um, Shra's already kind of introduced this, but uh, and I'll kind of walk through it. It's a single case presentation that we actually um, have under review um, right now at a journal um, that I think you guys will find interesting. One, just because of the kind of surprise that caught us off guard, and the other being um, just kind of some diagnostic uh, tools that I. As a scientist, I don't know why we don't use them more in the clinical realm, but I think they're starting to catch a little bit of steam um, in the clinical sector, um, and I think that will increase, and so I think um, it's good for you guys to at least be aware of as we go forward. Uh, so I have no financial disclosures. I'm a poor resident, um, so it's nothing to declare. Um, and so basically to start the case, this is a 69-year-old gentleman um, that was an immigrant from Ecuador. His only past medical history is that he had basically undergone multiple rounds of chemotherapy and uh, stem cell transplants for multiple myeloma. Um, and when he actually presented the ophthalmology clinic, he was currently receiving kind of some salvage therapy um, of chemotherapy, and there, those are the agents there. So he was immunosuppressed, um, at least from that standpoint. Um, and he initially presented the ophthalmology clinic uh, with blurry vision and pain around the left eye. Um, and that had been going on for a couple of weeks prior to uh, his presentation in the clinic. Um, the right eye on examination, so that was the completely asymptomatic eye, was unremarkable, at least from the external examination, so I'll focus on the left eye. Uh, left eye had hand motion vision when he was seen. Um, anterior segment was noted notable for KP, one plus cell and flare, and then one plus cell of the anterior vitreous face. Uh, on dilated eye exam, so in the right eye, you can see that he actually had a little, oh, sorry. Uh, well, it's okay. Um, he had a little hemorrhage here. We felt that that was related to his ongoing thrombocytopenia, so it was otherwise unremarkable. However, in his left eye, the symptomatic eye, he had diffuse retinal whitening, he had an inferior retinal detachment, scattered retinal hemorrhages, and then you can't really see it in this picture just due to all the different focal planes from this retinal detachment, but he also had optic nerve edema. Um, so it's a pretty, pretty significant um, involvement of the posterior segment of the left eye. Um, MAC OCT uh, was performed, and you can just see that this kind of reiterates that the fluid is all the way to the macula. There's some uh, retinal thickening here, um, and then you can't see it here, but there was also some choroidal thickening as well. Um, so then this picture, at least initially, looked like uh, any, uh, presumably a necrotizing viral retinitis. And so he was actually get started on Valtrex and given intravitreal phoscarnet. Um, after a few days, um, and then of course with every uveitis workup, they get um, the vampires after them and they get blood drawn. Um, and so he actually went, underwent an AC tap at that time. Um, all the herpetic organisms were negative. Um, and then he also underwent some systemic labs that were also unremarkable. So at this point, we're kind of scratching our head. We have this presumably viral necrotizing retinitis, negative lab work. Um, however, um, we gave him initial treatment, then we started him on actual oral steroid taper a couple days later. Um, the inflammation actually improved, however, his vision continued to decline. So when he returned, he had no light perception vision in that eye. Um, due to that concern, um, and maybe concern of this going to the other eye or this being um, something much uh, more significant, we ended up doing, or Dr. Shakur did a parse plan of vitrectomy with vitreous biopsy and sent that for flow cytometry and panorganism PCR. And we'll talk a little bit about that here in a second. Um, and to everyone's kind of surprised, and this is kind of why it's interesting, um, and we'll talk more about it as we go. Um, we were kind of perplexed. The only organism on this panorganism PCR was Trypanosoma crucii. Uh, so that's the kind of organism that causes Chagas disease, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. 
Um, so then uh, we decided to uh, kind of in the, the workup process um, with intraocular findings, presumably of Trypanosoma cruzii, uh, he underwent serum PCR and IgG analysis, both of which were positive. So we sent him to the infectious disease department. Um, they ended up talking to the uh, CDC. Um, we're actually in the process of getting him treatment for basically reactivated Chagas disease. Um, however, um, around that time he developed a small bowel obstruction and actually went home on comfort care um, instead of pursuing treatment that has um, quite a bit of side effects actually um, from a treatment standpoint. So why is this interesting? Well, first of all, so Chagas disease, uh, we don't see it a lot. Um, maybe it's underreported actually in the United States um, because of uh, some immigration issues. We don't necessarily um, have it high on our differential. However, there's about six million people in the United States that are infected with Chagas disease. Uh, it's passed through vector-borne <coughs> transmission, resulting in basically lifelong infection without adequate treatment. Um, so basically, once you've been infected, if you haven't been treated, um, which there aren't great treatment options, then you're basically indefinitely um, <coughs> infected. Um, it has a tropism, as we've all learned in medical school, for basically my myocardial tissue um, in about 30% of cases, and then uh, GI and neuronal tissue in about 10 to 20% of cases. Um, that's where most of the kind of uh, major issues arise. Uh, what we know, at least from Chagas in the eye, um, so we don't know actually a lot. Um, what we do know is that you can infect goats um, with basically an organism, so a sister organism of Chagas disease, and they actually will get chorioretinitis. Um, then people have su actually suggested um, in mouse models that the cornea could actually serve as a reservoir for Chagas disease and it could reactivate from actually the cornea. Um, so is it something that needs to be addressed from a corneal uh, transplant issue? I don't know, that's a big question. Um, then uh, we do know that in, at least in South America, that, uh, spe specifically in Argentina where most of these uh, studies have come out of, um, that patients with long-standing Chagas disease will get RPE changes seems to be visually insignificant, so it doesn't seem to have any sort of visual impact. Um, and then also out of Argentina, um, these cases were in congenital Chagas, but uh, a couple of uh, actually very young infants were referred for presumably ROP and actually found to have uh, disseminated Chagas disease that developed posterior uveitis rather than ROP. Um, and so they ended up being treated with basically systemic anti-Chagas therapy and uh, the posterior uveitis resolved. Um, so interesting, at least from the diagnosis standpoint, right? Um, but the thing that may be of more kind of uh, pertinence to all of us rather than chasing zebras is kind of the use of pain organism PCR. And this is kind of what I alluded to initially of Something that I think will be, well, is already becoming more standard of care than it, uh, than it was 10 years ago. Um, so PCR has been around for a long time. Um, what we know, at least from organism or at least organism isolation um, in ocular diseases. So in the EVS, so the vitrectomy study in the mid-90s, only 30% of those um, cultures were... Um, that's actually positive. So 30% of the cultures were positive. Larger studies since that time have, and this is using old techniques, so basically plating um, the, or, um, the specimen on plates and then trying to grow them in labs, 50% uh, of ocular cultures seem to grow something out of. So at least 50% of the samples we send are growing no organisms and they're Therefore, we can't target therapy to a specific organism. Um, what we also know is that PCR has outperformed culture-based techniques in HI, uh, HSV isolation, um, and that um, there's quite a bit of emerging literature now that PCR is actually outperforming old techniques, so culture techniques, to identify um, organisms in specimens. So previously negative specimens, at least from a microbiology standpoint, are now identifying organisms through PCR analysis. 
Um, and that's just, a lot of that's just related to sensitivity. It's pretty hard to grow some of these organisms, um, especially pretty fastidious organisms um, in the lab setting, um, let alone um, from uh, organisms um, isolated from uh, specific sites in the human body. Um, and so with that said, I'm not going to talk much more because we've got several talks, but uh, a lot of people have been instrumental in this. Um, the big thing, I think, to kind of go forward with this, so there, most of the PCR analysis is done at the University of Washington. Um, there's actually a, an infectious disease doctor here, too, that's interested in um, maybe doing some deep sequencing of uh, things as well. And so that, that's maybe something that becomes more um, central to the University of Utah as well. Um, so with that, um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take those at this point. Otherwise, uh, we'll move on to our next talk.